Hello, hello, hello. How are we all? I'm just going to get my little notes up. Thank you so much for coming out tonight or coming in tonight if you're in your living rooms, like I am. Um, my name is Rick Morton and on behalf of uh, the Geelong Regional Library Corporation, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event, Growing Up in Country Australia. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Wadawurrung people and the Eastern Ma original owners who are, who are the original owners on the land on which the library services operate. We pay respect to Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and celebrate the First Nations peoples of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge and story. And I'd just like to add that I'm on Bidjigal land, which is part of the Eora Nation here in Sydney. And Yusuf Saudi, our other guest tonight, is on Yorta Yorta country uh, in Shepparton in Victoria. Um, I will do some brief housekeeping reminders before we begin our discussion, because if I can't do any housekeeping in my own house, I will do it here. Um, please, you can absolutely participate in this webinar, and I, I encourage it. Um, if you click on the Q&A button, um, which is kind of at the bottom, I'm going to switch between some screens here, it's the bottom uh, third right button on your Zoom screen, it says Q&A with two boxes. If you click on that, um, you can type um, a question or a comment into that, and I will be checking that throughout the night um, and asking those questions um, at the end of the evening. If you're on an iPad or an iPhone, you may need to touch the screen first to see the Q&A function pop up. Um, I feel like I'm giving tech support. Um, not something I'm qualified for, I can assure you. Um, and just so you know, this webinar is being recorded. <clears throat> if you'd like to watch this discussion again or recommend it to friends or family, um, it will be uploaded to the library's YouTube channel within the next couple of days, um, which is why I'm going to be on my best behaviour. Um, before we begin uh, our discussion, I would like to give you a little bit of background about myself, seeing as I'm the guy here talking to you right now. <laughs> um, I'm a senior reporter at the Saturday paper, um, and you can often find me floating about uh, on ABC's The Drum or on radio somewhere. Um, I've got, I'm not going to read out these nice parts about me. Uh, I'm the author of um, three nonfiction books. My first is a, a family memoir, as I like to call it, um, called 100 Years of Dirt, which is telling the story about growing up in outback Queensland and family breakdown and intergenerational trauma that led to my mum raising the three of us kids in, in poverty after that in a little country town in southeast Queensland. Uh, my second book on money is an extended essay about how money and the lack of it when you're growing up changes you psychologically and what it means to have money later on in life and how you kind of see its value. And my most recent book that I've completely written myself is My Year of Living Vulnerably um, about uh, my complex post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis exactly three years ago, basically. I was um, just before I went off on the election campaign to follow Scott Morrison around the country, I was diagnosed. Um, not clinically recommended to do that, um, but that's uh, what ended up happening. And of course, this most recent collection, which I'm really proud of, um, uh, I, I got to edit uh, growing up in country Australia. Um, and I'm proud of it because there are almost 40 different contributors in this collection. And they just bring such a beautiful sense of writing and uh, kind of new stories to that, you know, very outdated now, I think, Australian myth of what it means to be in the bush. Um, or anywhere in country or regional Australia. And I'm very pleased to welcome one of those contributors um, to growing up in country Australia, Yusuf Saudi. Hello, Yusuf. Hey. Thanks, for, thanks for coming hey. and hanging out. Yeah, no, it's, it's fun. I'm just chilling out in the Shep. In the Shep. I love yep. the Shep. Um, just so you know who Yusuf is, he's uh, an award-winning journalist who's um, incredibly passionate about investigative journalism, um, interested in foreign affairs and giving a, a voice to people who are not particularly well represented uh, or misrepresented uh, in the media. Uh, he always aims to tell those stories that, you know, create impact in conversations and challenge people's ideas, which is precisely what journalism ought to be about. Um, so thank you so much for coming along tonight, mate. I'm so happy you're here. It's a pleasure. I'm really keen to chat with you and see all these awesome people listening in as well. I know. I always, I always like get so stoked when people <laughs> come to listen to bobbleheads like us talk about things. So <laughs> you're in, you're in downtown Metropolis, um, Shepparton this evening. Yeah. Am I correct? Yeah, that's right. I'm in the heart of Shepparton right now. Yeah. <laughs> how's how's life in Shepparton at the moment? Yeah, it, it, no, it's nice. It, I've been in Shepparton since the end of January, actually. So it's only been a couple of months and I'm just 
getting used to the whole the whole swing of things i just got i just bought a car recently oh yeah oh yeah i was um yeah it wasn't good because yeah since i moved from melbourne i was like oh i don't need to get a car so yeah but then i did because i was like hey can you give me a lift hey can you give me a lift to like all of my coworkers and yeah you know, I'm, yeah. I'm sure they loved you yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm having flashbacks right now to growing up in in buna where we eventually moved from the cattle station and you know there's no public transport i'm uh, presumably that's the same in alice spring for you spent a bit of your own time growing up yeah and, so oh uh, yeah, in Alice Springs. Oh, there were a few buses. Oh, wow, you had buses. Stop, stop, stop. Fancy. Um, it, it was a bit, yeah, it was, I wouldn't say fancy, but it was, <laughs> it was there. So as long as it was there, not during the night, but like, you know, in the mornings and maybe the afternoons, yeah. Yeah, nice. I like it. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself. I mean, uh, I guess I'll start off by asking why it was that you wanted to write for this collection in the first place i mean were you sitting at home like being the tortured artist going oh, i just i just need to tell my story or were you <laughs> figuring to other, figuring other stuff out hmm. no i don't know about that yeah look i i think it was because at that time it was just during lockdown and then i was kind of just writing heaps of random stuff in, in thoughts and stuff like that i think with this particular story idea I think it just came to me in a shower, actually. Like, I was like, oh, yeah, right. Because the name of the my chapter, like, P Pauper, it's actually just, like, an inside joke between me and my brother. But then I was like, but what does that actually mean again? And then I was like, oh, yeah. And so, so I kind of just wrote that. And then it was going to be, like, for this other thing. But then I missed the deadline. And then <laughs> 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 so... Um, oh. Yeah, this is that line. But look, then this came along. I was like, "Oh, I'll give it a go." And then I was like, "How, oh. how good's missing a deadline?" By the way, it really makes you feel alive, doesn't it? Yeah, no, I was like, "Oh, bugger, cool." <laughs> <laughs> but then I saw this. I was like, "Oh, this could work. I can make it work." It, it all connects. Yeah, and you, then, you can, and you did. Exactly. I thought I wouldn't have. It was an absolute hell mary because was the first time I was submitting something for a book so I was like oh we'll give it a go and then I did it here for like six months <laughs> and I was like yeah look probably not <laughs> we might find a different home for it maybe that's, maybe that's, all, that's also my fault I, I should have. <laughs> uh, I was given uh, we opened the selection or the submissions up for growing up in country Australia I can't even remember exactly when but it was a long time before I finally got around to reading the submissions because there were about 400,000 words um from you know hundreds of people who had submitted stuff to this collection and at the same time i was judging the national biography award for the state library of new south wales so i was trying to read 66 books um between january and may last year um and poor old black ink the publishers were just like oh have you had a chance to have a look through everything yet and have you read everything and i was like i was stressing that to the max because you know i thought it would be fairly obvious who the final 40 um kind of submitters would be and then to read the quality of the stuff that came in uh it was so good and there were some really heartbreaking decisions i had to make where you know some pieces just didn't quite make it in but they were you know we could have published twice the number so it was like incredibly um competitive um but also i'm entirely responsible for you having to wait six months to find out <laughs> uh, yeah but, Take this as my apology, Yusuf. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. No, <laughs> it, was, it was really funny when I found out because I was just hanging out with my friends and yeah, like I, I just checked my laptop and then I, I like made the biggest gasp. I was like, <gasps> and then they thought it was like, <laughs> what's wrong, Yusuf? And then I was like, I'm going to be in a book. They're like, what? <laughs> Whoa. I was like, I submitted this like six months ago. Like, I did not think this would be. And then I like cold, like, I don't know. One of my friends actually from Alice Springs, I was like, oi, remember? Because I actually I had this weird moment where I just contemplated a lot of things. Um, <laughs> because I was visiting Alice Springs, actually, while I was writing my little piece as well. And then so I just had a lot of different thoughts come up. And then I like talked about it with one of my friends from Alice Springs. Like who I went to high school with. And I was like, 
that was really weird when they said that hey <laughs> and so yeah and then I it was so odd because I like called my friend um in Alice Springs about it that night and then I was like yeah remember how I like said this and this I included it in a book and it got accepted <laughs> yeah and just wow. to, to tell everyone uh, i don't want to give too much away but just generally speaking tell what what is the story you chose to write um for this piece you did something that a lot of writers never managed to do in that you would manage to do it in a very concise <laughs> short and sharp manner <laughs> again I, I guess it's just my journalistic <laughs> sense coming in it's like concise short sentences no i don't know <laughs> um yeah it was, it was so it's about growing up in, in Alice Springs. Well, yeah, because how long were you in Alice Springs for? Oh, well, I basically grew up there. Like I came there when I was two. Um, yeah, because my my parents moved there in 2002 when I, that's my age right now. And, <laughs> and so, yeah, because they moved, they moved all around the world essentially because my parents are originally from Egypt and so you know things got really weird in the 90s and the 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 gulf war started and so they found it really difficult to find work because the economy was just weird even though they were like qualified mm. but and so the same thing they basically experienced when they moved to australia in melbourne at first and it was still really difficult like they were still on centrelink my parents they tried to do more study and that kind of stuff but it was still like really tricky but then yeah it was it was my mom being sponsored by this this private practice in png in papua new guinea because she, she's a she's a doctor right yeah, right? She's, yeah yeah she's a general practitioner and my dad finding a job in the newspaper <laughs> in papua new guinea and uh, yeah it's still weird like that's the thing you know that that was a, a yeah like it's kind of funny as a journalist i'm like oh a newspaper Papua new guinea it's 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 all connected yeah, it makes all the sense in the world to me yeah and so they moved to png and that's where my brother was born and me as well like they moved around so i was born in lay which you don't really hear about often you know you know about port moresby which is where my brother was born but yeah i was born in lay and then they were like, okay, we need to head back to Alice. Well, we need to be- head back to <laughs> Australia. <laughs> they were, I don't know if they were thinking specifically they about were, Alice Springs. They weren't targeting Alice Springs. <laughs> <laughs> but they were kind of just applying all over. And then and then Alice Springs was just the first place they got offered a job. Yeah, really. And yeah, I think because living in a PNG was actually like amazing from all like their stories that they tell me. Mm. Like my mom got like really cool recipes from there and she made some good friends and my like my siblings tell me stories about just how nice it was like living in a tropical island but like I guess I don't really have that much memory of it and Mm. I guess things also just got tricky as well because the place where they were living in as well is just it wasn't the safest place like there was a time where my my dad well like our house got robbed and my dad was like found like at gunpoint actually by like these these burglars it was wild and so and my my sister because she was like a teenager at that time as well like she used to be followed by a security guard to make sure that like nothing happened to her so there were a lot of like yeah like you know these uh, yeah there's several stories and as a doc as my mom was a doctor as well she like heard like horror stories about like things happening to women as well yeah it was just it was a mix of things you know yeah and so they end up in Alice Springs um because again presumably that's where the jobs were or a job for your mum yeah I think I, at that time they just really needed doctors and I think that's still a thing across regional Australia um yeah, like I, I know that nursing is still a big issue, um, like yeah. for remote communities. But my mum actually just worked in Alice Springs. She she never really worked in a remote community. But yeah, it's yeah, it, it's interesting just how my mum just kind of moved. She's really yeah. I she sounds like an amazing woman. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to meet her one day. Um, 
I, I don't know if people, people who've read my stuff know that I'm like, I, I love mums. <laughs> All mums are my favorite. Um, and so you're at Alice Springs. Uh, I, you know, so there's obviously a, a huge First Nations population in the Northern Territory. Um, but in terms of people who are from, you know, Egypt, um, you know, uh, other places in the Middle East, uh, were there many other people like yourself there? No, nah, not really. Yeah, look, no, nah, I wouldn't say that it's a vibrant um, Middle East population, <laughs> but I would, yeah, like, for example, I was obviously the only Egyptian in my school, and I think there was maybe one or two other Muslims who were in my school. We were, like, yeah, yeah, to, yeah like, it was it was really, it was nice because you had like just two other friends and then they were like kind of your best friends, like in a way, like even though you're maybe a couple grades below or, or above them, you still like kind of connected in a way because yeah. um, you were both like minorities. And yeah, like for example, we were just very close with this Afghan family. Um, we, you know, obviously different countries different cultures different continents but like we we connected because we were both we were both from muslim backgrounds and there weren't many muslims and yeah like there there's people who i'm still in contact with and but also yeah like i i guess like it was something that i wasn't really phased by because that's how i always lived like i was always kind of the only egyptian person and it's yeah. interesting to see how a lot of people like group up in their racial groups sometimes but like at that point like it was kind of like you find similarities in different ways which is kind of what i touch on in the book because yeah. you, you know like some of my best friends were like indigenous people like some of my best friends were african some of my best friends yeah like are, are from various like backgrounds because we always found like different things that we connected with you know yeah i was quite surprised i was in alice springs a couple of years ago and i was quite surprised by how multicultural it is um and i probably shouldn't have been surprised because it's so close to indonesia for example and um and i'm kind of on the gateway to that region of that part of the world but um, growing up in Queensland, and certainly Boona, which is changing now, but when we moved there, it was white. <laughs> like uh, it was at that point in time, the Chinese restaurant still, if you were eating there, they still had on the menu like chicken and chips um, for people who quite weren't quite ready to try actual Chinese food. Um, <laughs> for a long time, that was me uh, because <laughs> we were just like incredibly sheltered. And so, like, even, like, at, at my high school, Boone State High School, um, we had um, a couple of kids from other countries, but it was, like, two or three. Um, and, you know, one of them was Vietnamese, uh, one of them was Chinese, and one of them was an adopted uh, adopted girl um, being raised by her Australian family. And that was it. And, like, it was just such a closed-off world. Yeah, right. And I, yeah, and, like, it's so strange. It's one of the reasons, I guess, I wanted to get all these different stories for this collection because my childhood is so different and in a way so you know we've heard these stories before in Australia it's like oh great you grew up in the country and you're white good for you <laughs> um, and there's so much more out there yeah yeah no exactly and the thing is I'm yeah there were it was a diverse population in Alice Springs like I was the only Egyptian, but there was, you know, there's a large Filipino population. There's a large, um, yeah, there's obviously a large in Indian community as well. There's still like a lot of different communities and like, as well as like Pacific Islanders as well. Like, yeah. so I, that's why I like with this story, like I, I wanted to highlight this. It's a multicultural place and it's, it, it has a large First Nations population as well, but it also, it's kind of interesting because it, it, it's, it's, I feel like it's, it's the heart of Australia, but it is a really great reflection of the rest of Australia and some of the issues that are there because you kind of just see direct racism like everywhere. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's interesting because you don't really think about it until you leave the town. Yeah, well, you don't know what you don't know at the time, right, do you? 
yeah. and like I mean certainly like I look back on things that I heard in the schoolyard and I'm like holy like how were we a, how did anyone allow us to say things like that um, and you start your piece off by you know these slurs that allegedly your alleged friends or people you were friendly with were yeah. calling you um, at school I, mean, I don't want you to say them necessarily word for word but like give me your, <laughs> um, like it was pretty full-on stuff yeah I think it's it's interesting to think about because at that time I was like oh you know they're just they're just silly words and then I think it, it was some of these things like I don't it takes me a while to think to think about sometimes and then I'm like that was actually really weird like I I knew at that point that it was bad <laughs> and then I kind of let it go and then I thought about it again and I was like yeah that was weird like that was really odd and you knew the significance of that so yeah like because I remember having a moment I think while I was writing the piece where I was like the meaning of these words and I was like I was like I actually like deeply hurts because I feel like they they uh, they perhaps didn't know what they were doing or maybe they did but still like those are things that I never said that they could say and it was kind of like it was just it just felt like very dehumanizing in a way because you know it's it's the thing where it's like oh you know you're joking with the boys so you want to laugh along you don't want to seem like yeah it too seriously you know like oh no you don't take it too seriously but yeah it's it kind of really it's yeah it's really destructive um like it's it's stuff that you shouldn't joke about and I think it's something that yeah it, it I mean I guess like when I was in high school it was just something that was said very casually and I it, yeah it's it's just that casual racism that yeah it kind of gets dismissed yeah, because it's the stuff where it's like, oh, you know, you know, it's harmless, right? They're having a joke. Because, I mean, I used to I used to not just bear witness to, but I joined in on the casual homophobia in my school because I was like, fuck, I'm gay and I don't want anyone to know. So I'm going to do some careful misdirection. Um, and if the boys were laughing about, like, that's so gay or yelling the F word, I was like, yeah, ha, ha cool. And, like, I was part of it. I'm not saying you were part of the racism. <laughs> that would be very weird. Um, but like as a, because I could hide, I chose to hide. Um, yeah. Whereas, you know, that choice is not yours. Well, the thing is though, like, I think at that time it was very evident. And I felt like at that point I was very, it was, it was hard to not, well, at that point I didn't see the significance of me telling people about my background but it's actually it's it's weird because and it's actually kind of bad like on my side right now because like i i can understand that like uh, you know the benefits of hiding parts of your identity because you yeah like for example one of my co-workers actually um yeah like um well yeah he was kind of like oh why didn't you tell me that you were muslim earlier and i was like I, it didn't come up yeah, <laughs> yeah we offered you like alcohol and <laughs> and then I was like oh yeah <laughs> 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 because I just didn't want you to treat me differently if I told you and I just wanted to seem like I was like anyone else and I don't want you to think that I'm less Australian or something like that if I if I even though I didn't drink alcohol like if, yeah I absolutely said no, like, and it's an absolute no from me for alcohol because I know that's a big thing in Australian culture, obviously. But Tell me like, about it. There's four pubs in one street in my hometown. Like, that's that's a lot of pubs, uh, all in one spot. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's like, yeah, I, I, I find those things really interesting. And it's amazing how that kind of, you know, even when you're around people who probably are fine, but you don't know that and you don't want to upset anyone and you start policing yourself. Um, and like that psychological baggage hangs around for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, to, not to diagnose you or anything like that. Yusuf, I, um, um, I'm not a mental health practitioner. No. Yeah. I think that it's, 
I, I think with a lot of things, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it, you kind of are just like, you're, you're kind of just always maybe in fight or flight mode. And sometimes you're always just kind of going with the flow and you don't really think about it too much until later reflecting about it. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. Um, I think while I'm here, I should probably give people an overview of what else is in the collection as well. I mean, you could have written the whole thing, I think, Yusuf. Uh, <laughs> maybe next time. But um, there's, I mean, there's some really beautiful pieces in there. Uh, and, you know, stories about yabbying and, and all of these things that I can um, relate to. There's a story by, um, I think it's Jay Carmichael, who's written this really beautiful piece about lust and longing for someone who he's not entirely sure is his, you know, shares his sexuality. Um, and there's this kind of ends in tragedy. And it's something I related to uh, in a really kind of enormous way, I guess, because it could have been written about my own experience in high school when I was still very much in the closet. I used to tell people, I'm like, I didn't come out of the closet so much as it was dismantled from around me, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> like in a terrifying bunning sort of way. Uh, not home improvement. <laughs> yeah. Did someone just see you kiss a guy and was like, oh, okay. Yeah, like, holy shit. Uh, <laughs> no, God, I'm not that brave. Uh, I wouldn't have I would have come out that way. <laughs> um, but I guess, you know, I was like reading through these things. The one thing I was struck by, because I was expecting and I wanted to get, I wanted to get away from the Banjo Pattersons and the Henry Lawsons of the world, even though I fully believe Loaded Dog is one of the greatest stories ever written. Um, I, I just wanted new stuff. But the stuff that still comes through, and I, I love this because it's what really I think marked my childhood for the better is the natural landscape. You know, I think there's something about being so close to wide open space, to kind of animals and nature and running water that is beneficial to the soul, but also to the mind. Like when you're growing up, I just think, and I don't know about you, Yusuf, but I know that yeah. No, my mum was such a curious little hobbit um, or just like kind of guiding me through this world. I, I still have this vivid memory of my dad and my mum telling me to put my ear up against the tree. My dad is like the opposite of a hippie, right? Like he, he, would, he would not like Extinction Rebellion, put it that way. Um, uh, and, but he was like, put your ear up against the tree. You can hear it eating. And if you put your head up against this kind of clear bark tree, you can hear stuff kind of like running up inside it. And it's just like this really, it's like the perfect education. And it was better than any other education I ever had. And it was because I, I got access to all this stuff growing up in the country. And like Alice is, the Alice is so beautiful. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you, like, did you, were you conscious of that when you were there? Or were you just like one of these moody teenagers who were like, I want to get out? Oh, it's a bit of both, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Because I just know that, I really, you know, the thing that is very distinguishable about Alice Springs is always being surrounded by rock mountains. It's just yeah. all around you. And it's probably my favourite thing about Alice Springs because everywhere you go, you see, like, rock mountains. And they're gorgeous as well. And they're based on the dreaming stories of the caterpillars. Um, yeah. There's, for the yeah, Arante people, yeah. The, the Aranda people, yeah. yeah. Like the McDonough Ranges, um, the, yeah it's really interesting there's like I lived right next to this the telegraph station um and well it kind of like shows it points a lot of history about telegraph <laughs> <laughs> like how we but, wired the bush yeah. um, but actually it's it's where the spring is that where Alice's spring is actually ah. yeah it's kind of funny because like on the sign there they're like this guy made it for his wife or something. I don't, yeah, I think like he made it for his wife um, whose name is Alice. It's Alice's spring, but it was never noted that she actually came and checked it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did, please tell me they still fell in love and they died together or something like that. Or did she leave him? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't detail that part. Yeah, yeah, they never do. You should say never. Maybe she just didn't want to check out Alice Springs. Alice Springs. <laughs> but, right. It's a pretty, it's a pretty hard landscape. I remember in my first book, I remember researching my family's history, um, and they're all settlers on the Birdsville track, and so you know, quite in addition to all of that kind of 
um, history between First Nations people and the white settlers, you've just got these kind of Scottish immigrants, which is what my dad's side of the family were, trying to figure out like in the worst possible environment how to live. And like my a few generations, like in the 1800s, as far back as I could track it, the first relative of my dad, my first ancestor that I can go back to, they built a house on the Birdsall track where it gets to like 50 degrees in summer and they didn't have any windows in this house. It was literally just a box. Um, and, and it's just such a weird, it's like, why? And I think it's because of the dust storms. But um, there's kind of weird sense of kind of brutalised optimism. So like the, the wife of this couple, even though they didn't have windows in this house, decided that she would hang curtains where she thought the windows ought to be. <laughs> and I think there's something quite lovely in a weird way about that approach to living in these really difficult places. Um, and, you know, Alice is rugged as they come, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a wild landscape. You know, it's, it's basically like this. It's really fun here's, driving around. Here's what I want to know. How many times did you see the Todd River flood? Oh, like a few times. And it was like on the news, like that kind of thing. And it would be like everyone's talking about it and taking videos and you'd go and see it. And then some people were like, oh, I heard this person jumped in and died. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Don't go jump in. And like it was really, no, it was really fun when that when that happened. But like whenever it rained in Alice Springs, it was huge. Like I remember actually because I was in Alice Springs just just in January, um, doing stuff with um, the ABC there. And I was, it started raining and they were like, Yusuf Saudi is going to do a live cross <laughs> outside in the rain. And then I was like, it's raining. Right? Like it was at, like, I, my inner I still childhood. love, yeah, I love that <laughs> feeling so much. Like checking the rain gauge when I was a kid on the cattle station was the most exciting thing that I could do. Like if the moment we heard rain on the roof, after an hour or so, we would run out to the rain gauge and yell out how many points it was because we were old school and still measured in points because um, that's just how we do it. Even today, like mum in Boona um, has her own little rain gauge in the yard and some of the most scintillating chats we have in the family group chat are when mum sends through the rain updates, <laughs> particularly over the last La Nina period, which has been yeah. ridiculous ridiculous but like that idea and I learned funnily enough I learned last year when I was writing or maybe it was a year before I was writing a piece for Island magazine about drought and I've I learned in the research for that what this there's a, there's a name a word for that smell that rain makes yeah. when it's about to come and Annabelle Crabb's written about it in this collection and it's called Petri Petricor mm. um, which is amazing and it was coined by CSI IRO scientists um which is, I don't know, I just, I am a nerd for stuff like that. I'm like, oh, so there, yeah, I wasn't just making it up. There is a smell that yeah. comes from the earth. What's it like in Alice? It sounds, that sounds like such a clinical name, Petricor. Doesn't it? Petricor. You could get it at a chemist, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's a, I would it's love a topic, it topical, <laughs> topical ointment. I would love that, actually. It's amazing smell. If I would love a it. dose of Petricor. It's, oh. it's, it's the smell of relief. Uh, yeah of you know cattle can smell it um yeah. they're, they're quite adept at apparently picking up petrichor on the wind over many kilometers so they move or they get excited and agitated because they know the rain's coming i think like when i was a kid petrichor kind of smelled like sand in a way yeah that's so interesting and when it rained <laughs> i was like oh it smells so good and then i think yeah. I like yeah it's like the same thing you know so i did that because it was like yeah it was really good i liked it um petrichor it was yeah that did you I, they should make oh, it I, in oil yeah but yeah or some kind of like perfume of some description um uh, uh I, if i can do it i mean i don't know i'll give them all of my money uh, there's, <laughs> there's no doubt about that did you have to catch a school bus by the way yeah of course yeah yeah. Were you on one of those country school buses where it was the same kids every day and no members of the public? Or oh yeah, absolutely. Every yeah. every morning, and then either I would catch it or I would miss it, and my mum would <laughs> like yell at me as I, as she's driving me to school. Oh my but, god, how how bad is it when you like you miss the country school bus and your yeah. parents are just like, "What is wrong with my kid?" And then you cop it. Yeah, it's not good. But um, yeah, I remember just you know. 
I could either be running up there like in the last two minutes like two minutes before it comes I'd be like sprinting like and I've become a good runner because of that <laughs> like, it, like there was one that was just like I think just a couple hundred meters away from my place and then there was um yeah so I could either get there early like five or ten minutes and I'm like yeah and then I would like see all the people sometimes like you make friends there and sometimes they're just familiar faces for a good few years <laughs> so you yeah. just never talk to them <laughs> and then you're just like hey. hey and then you're like morning and then there's the interchange as well I don't know oh god yes we had that I fucked that up when I was a, the first time I ever had to catch one of those buses I stayed on the bus at the interchange um and the bus driver was like terrified when he discovered that I was just like sitting up the back of the bus like smiling hoping to get to my school <laughs> yeah no it was and the interchange in Alice Springs it, it can get a bit rowdy so like actually like when I was yeah in like primary school and high school like they that could be like the place where people would like do all kinds of things like you would get into fights you'd like <laughs> but then so because of that actually I think yeah towards the end of my high school like you can't really like get out and hang out at the interchange they're just like stay in your buses until you change <laughs> to the next time <laughs> so that's that's what it's like now in the spring they're like yeah we don't trust the kids yeah at all. <laughs> exactly but that's like the best moment because that's when you can like talk to all of your friends from like different schools and stuff like that yeah yeah, yeah. the kids from the different schools always terrified me not because i knew them but just because they wore different uniforms and it's like it tapped into that deep human instinct to treat people differently um, and I was just like really I was just like oh there's Mount Alfred school don't look um, because that's all I knew at the time um, there were so many entries to this collection about the country school bus and like personally I was thrilled because I could talk about the politics of the school bus the seating arrangements yeah. um, one guy drew, drew a diagram um, it didn't make it into the collection, but he literally do a diagram like one of those tr plain seating schemas when you choose where you sit on Qantas or whatever. And um, and then attached like uh, a set of equations to figure out where your hierarchy was on the bus, whether you got to sit up at the back with all the cool kids, whether you had to sit at the front. And it was based on age as well as cool status. Where were you based? That's the question. I, I was very much a middle of the bus kind of guy. Which okay. is yeah, I was kind of like, I was the centrist of the school bus. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I was like, you know, my brother was older and cooler and he was always at the back. And so I had like a free pass yeah. to go up the back, but I chose rarely to use it mm -hmm. because honestly, there were a lot of energy and I just, I just wanted to read my book. I uh, wanted to tear through the latest Goosebumps no novel and not be disturbed, yeah. um, which That's is how that worked. Yeah. Were, were you up the back? Yeah, what made you think that? Just, just, just I just think it's, the, I think it's the yellow turtleneck actually. Just, it's just like yeah. there's a guy that knows his style. Yeah, look, I was at the back most. Yeah, yeah. Very, Were you a good student? I was like one of those students who wanted to fly under the radar, but it was hard for me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> like I was like oh no I'm flying under the radar but I'm gonna run for college captain and I'm flying under the radar so I'm gonna lie about my grades actually to my friends um so like I would be like oh yeah I got like a C on this and then they were like you got an A minus I can see you through the crowd. <laughs> oh my god that's the saddest thing I've ever heard you, you were like lying to downgrade your grades yeah exactly um and uh, yeah, I used to, it wasn't, it wasn't good. Like I used to like act, act dumb in front of my friends. And then like in year 12, I got like academic excellence. They were like, what was that? Yeah, like some, some part of this does not add up and we're not good at math. And if we were, we'd figure it out. Yeah, but I yeah. wasn't good at math. I definitely wasn't, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was, I struggled. I struggled. Um, the other, I mean, Alice is you know, relatively large. It's not huge. Um, how many people live in Alice Springs now? I think it's nearly 30,000 people. Yeah. So it's like, you know, where I, you know, where I grew up, Metropolis. Uh, but it's like, <laughs> not a lot, not a lot still. And I remember like, so like, part of the thing that's always captivated me about, you know, country living, and I'm curious to hear our audience's thoughts on this, by the way. So if you've got questions you want to ask, please jump in. Um, but like, the, the idea that 
there's a sense of anonymity living in like Sydney or Melbourne um, or Brisbane even these days where you can kind of blend into the crowd and no one knows who you are. Whereas in country towns and uh, kind of small villages, almost everyone knows who you are or the chances of you running into someone who knows you or being seen doing the grocery shopping by someone who knows you are extremely high. Uh, And I think that does something to the brain. And I think it's mostly a good thing, although it can be like when I go home now to Boona on the holidays, I was just back there over Christmas. And like, it would take me 35 minutes to go and get coffee because I would get stopped by every second person. Um, I was like, oh my God, Rick, you're home. How are you? And like, it's been like that ever since I left high school. It's not because I'm a successful author um, or a journalist. Like it's been that way since I left school and I was a nobody. And I come home and people are like, oh, how's, you know, the Gold Coast? How's Brisbane? How's Sydney? And it's like constant. And it's how they spread gossip, which is very much, I think, a universally, well, universally accepted way for the human species to keep tabs on each other going back to when we used to live in really small clans to know, you know, who was good at working, who was good at sharing the workload, who was going to, you know, um, steal your wife, (laughs) like all of these things. That's where gossip came from. And it's like country towns are still really good at it. And I don't know whether you found that, like that sense of lack of anonymity in Alice Springs versus, you know, anywhere else that you've lived in since. Yeah. That was a very long-winded question. I was trying to do half monologue, half question. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I know, like, in Alice Springs, you become a professional at, like, acting as if you didn't see someone. I don't know if you ever had to do that, but, like... (laughs) Oh, yeah. So often you're like, oh, I don't know if I saw that person. (laughs) And you kind of get used to it. Yeah, yeah. uh, Tom Tom Pleasy in the Q&A has just written, the old rural panopticon. (laughs) <laughs> um, I do miss the anonymity of the city. Do you know what? I can't make up my mind about what I prefer. I like. I feel like I could spend six months of the year in the city and six months in the country, and I would be the happiest version of myself. I don't know. Are you like busting to get back to Melbourne or Sydney and just stay there forever? I don't know. I mean, because I like traveling. I like going around and traveling the world and Australia, and so. At first, it was like, I just want to be in a metro place. But, like, I feel like I understand more about, I understand more about Australia and more about myself and more about the world when I go to different places. And I feel like when you're just in the city, you just have a city perspective sometimes. Because I know a city perspective and I know a country town perspective. And I think it's good to get a mix. But, like, I guess it would be nice to just be in the city because, I guess... There's more people. And I liked your first answer. I liked your first <laughs> answer. It was, like, it was philosophical and nuanced. <laughs> but yeah, I guess. But like, yeah, no, I think that, yeah, it's hard to pinpoint sometimes because I would like to just like travel around and move around because it's hard to think about where I would like <laughs> settle down. Where you got to settle. <laughs> you say, yeah. How old are you? <laughs> no, that's it's not. You're a baby. You're a baby. <laughs> You've got like at least 20 years. Yeah. but Maybe, maybe not quite. 20, look, I don't know. Time's ticking, time's ticking. Ticking, it's, it's time to have kids right now. Like, just, <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing? Like, <laughs> you know, I'm aimless, road, like, wandering. I need to get married, I need to have kids and get a house. I need to... Oh God, you sound like my mum. <laughs> yeah, that's, that. I, I it's actually really interesting, though, like thinking about the, the housing costs, like because I wanted I, to ask you about that, like <laughs> uh, but with, without telling me what your rent is in Shepparton, what is the rent like in Shepparton? It's well, it's I did a story recently on how we're in a rental market crisis, actually. So please and, tell me about that, because I'm like in the process of dealing with the similar things with my mum in Boona, where the property market has gone bonkers. And like this is Boona. Um, and people are like from the city are moving there and paying enormous amounts for houses that are not worth that much money. <laughs> yeah, no, I um, think, um, yeah, it is really tricky at the moment. Like I am living here because coincidentally, one of my friends who I studied with also is working at the same place as I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. 
Yeah, he's an. I'm a news journalist, and he's a sports journalist. Boo, sports. No, I love sports. <laughs> Me love trying sports. to read his articles, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I got the first <laughs> line. Maybe <laughs> I need to they gave 110 percent out there on the field today. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, like, and then they start using this lingo, and I'm like, this is a different world to me. And then I remember like trying to read his sports article. I was like, is this footy? <laughs> like, this is cricket? I'm not sure. I need a photo to figure yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, I hate when they don't have the photos. I'm like, oh, I'm out. I can't yeah. follow them but, but, um, like, but, but like, what is the, like, what's it like there at the moment, rent-wise, property yeah. market-wise? Well, yeah, it is a rental market crisis. I, it's like, um, it's really competitive to find a place. It's, you kind of need to really hone in on your con- connections and that kind of stuff because yeah I remember applying for a few places and it was tricky um <clears throat> because like I talked to I talked to this family actually who um yeah like this this mother who is essentially she's the primary carer of her whole family yeah, um, wow. yeah because her husband um lives with a disability her three children live with autism and so she essentially has the responsibility to find a place for her her family of five um it might actually be more children um yeah but like it was it's really wild because that they all live with disabilities and so she also needs to find a place that would be accessible for them too and and she's been trying to find a place for a year and a half and it, yeah, it's just wild. I, I don't know if, if things have changed for her since that was... Where were they living in the interim? Well, they are living currently, I think, at this... Yeah, like, at a house. But, like, everything in their house is packed up in boxes. So they're ready to leave. Yeah, wow. Like, they have been ready to leave for over a year. And everything is just packed up in boxes. And they have, like, a stack of papers of, like you know, applications being declined, but it's really tricky for them because yeah, since then it was a really weird story because their, their landlords apparently passed away. So they were told to like, get out. Like Uh, it's it's just really tricky for them. It's really tricky for them to find a place. And yeah, I just feel they're just in a pickle because like the the mother is, kind of has that whole weight of her shoulder yeah. and she has to also take care of her kids and her husband and she has to like kind of seem optimistic as well yeah yeah that's like honestly i remember growing up with mum like single mum like the burden of optimism that is placed on you when things are looking pretty dire sometimes is like the cognitive dissonance that that creates i think i find really interesting where it's like you were having to say it'll be okay and then not knowing in your head whether it actually will be. Um, and I think you could say the same thing about many kind of issues in regional Queensland, uh, regional Australia, I should say. I'm not just a Queensland guy. Uh, oh, I told you I was tired. Um, I was babysitting my friend's kids, by the way, everyone, before I got here tonight, into, back into my own house. <laughs> so I'm frazzled. Um, by the way, we've got another 10 minutes left of this session. So if you've got any more questions, it doesn't have to be about stuff that we been talking about tonight you can ask me my star sign um who i think is going to win the election uh anything you want um if you've got any burning um questions for yusuf hit us up but we're just going to keep gabbing basically yeah until eight thirty. so if you don't ask questions i'm just going to keep talking and some would say that that's the incentive to ask questions um if you want i don't want to put any pressure on anyone we're not that kind of we're not those kind of people are we um i was talking to my mum um recently about you know this kind of idea of country because well, about the property stuff because she brought her house in Boona. She was lucky as a single mum to be able to get, um, you know, a, a loan for a house. And it was the only, only one bank would touch her and it was Suncorp and they gave her a loan for $77,000 in the year 2000. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to ask that one in two seconds. Thank you, Tom. We like Tom. Tom's been asking lots of questions. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I love an engaged citizen but like I was talking to mum about like buying this house and it was like if she hadn't been able to buy that house at that precise window of time in the year 2000 um, she would never have made it onto the property market because that was the last time she could afford the prices you know after that they just kept going up and up and up 
um, and her income stayed the same, um, basically. So it's just kind of, it's a crushing sense of, you know, where are this generation single mums, for example, going to afford to rent um, or potentially buy to secure their own financial future for their kids? And I don't know where that is. Um, maybe I should write some more about that, um, seeing as I'm so obsessed. Um, Tom, uh, has, <laughs> Yusuf, what was the biggest shock, good or bad, about moving from Alice Springs uh, to the city? Did you move directly to the city or did you go via other? Oh, yeah, no, straight from Alice Springs to the city. Yeah. So um, tell me, I'm curious. What was the biggest? <laughs> well, yeah, it was funny because, like, after school, I wanted to, like, go straight away. But then I was like, I also can't afford to move yet <laughs> because it's <laughs> Melbourne. And... So I like took some time off a little bit. And then I remember like being unsure, like where I'm supposed to go. I'm like, should I go to Adelaide or Melbourne? Because like Adelaide is like really big to move to. Like yeah. um, Alice Springs because of like proximity. It's like kind of like the mini big smoke of <laughs> the people yeah. in Alice Springs. It's like, oh, Adelaide, you know. Um, and, and a lot of my friends have moved there for uni and so I was contemplating that but then I also got into Melbourne and then I kind of just like I made a lot of friends like who were from Melbourne as well like in Alice Springs there's your first mistake <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah they were like yeah come to Melbourne and then I remember visiting in the middle of yeah like the year at some point and then I was like yeah I'm gonna do it and then so when I first moved, I think I was like living in Carlton. And then, so that was like very city vibes. And I was like, at first I didn't think about it too much. And then like, I think a couple of weeks in, I was like, what the, <laughs> how did I get here? Just, I was I'm... legit like, how did I get here? Like, what am I doing here? <laughs> I was like, oh, am I even supposed to be here? Yeah. Like, you feel like you, you're like, do I have permission to be yeah. in the city? And it was funny because I actually blended in quite well into Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> because like a lot of people like oh whereabouts in melbourne would you would you go to school like everyone just thought i was from melbourne because i think it was just is it the turtleneck yeah i think so but yeah i think it was just maybe my my clothes it's funny though because you know not every country person just wears um you know i actually have one of these (laughs) not every country person (laughs) We don't always wear an Akubra, even though I do have one. We don't always wear it. Is that um, a real Akubra or is that a knockoff? No, it's a, it's your it's your Australia's finest leather hats. Oh yeah, there you go. Jackaroo. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Always wear it, even though it's right next to me. Um, we don't always, but like, yeah, I think it was interesting because I kind of blended in very well and I feel like I could have so just lied about my life and been like, yeah, I like went to like Melbourne, like high. And, <laughs> but yeah, I was kind of, I remember having like an existential crisis and being like, what is urban life? Like, what does urban life mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I like that is such a great like essay question yeah. um, or like a, like a start talking about, you know, you know, a, a writing prompt even. Um, yeah. Jen Chamberlain's got a really interesting question here. I'm very curious about your answer to this. Are either of you concerned about the disconnect between city views and country views? In the previous generation, most people who lived in the city had cousins in the country and would visit. Now that connection seems not to exist. She was saying she lived on a farm near Swan Hill. I, like, honestly, I think that's bang on the money. Like, I, we were the, the country cousins for my city um, my mum's side of the family. Like I remember my cousins, which the irony is that they all lived in Boona for the most part, which is where we <laughs> moved to, which is still country. But they would come out to the cattle station to visit. And, you know, I remember my dad being quite critical of one of my older cousins because he couldn't ride a horse. And that's how my dad judged everyone. He's like, he can't ride a fucking horse. Um, and that was just, he was dead to him. Um, and I'm like, I can't ride a horse. Um, but I was protected somehow. But, you know, there was this, cross-pollination, I guess, of ideas between city and country that seems to be on the outer. I don't know whether you think the same thing, Yusuf, but certainly there are people who have spent, are born in the city, who spend their entire time in the city, and to the extent that they see the country at all, it's on the way to somewhere else that is also the city. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting because 
I'm still trying to grapple the city mindset a bit because I feel like growing up in Alice Springs, it's kind of depressing because I like I kind of felt like I had no hope. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> like I was like, I'm not going anywhere in life at all. Like I'm gonna be at Alice Springs forever. I don't know. Like I'm no, that not saying that, you know, when you're No, in I know what you mean. I mean as you know, teenagers go through that angsty phase, particularly yeah. where they're just like, oh, what am I doing with my life? There's nothing here for me, there's no opportunity. I need to leave. It's such a common thing that, you know, people in the country worry about it of their children that they'll leave and never come back. Yeah, I think is, yeah, because I remember like having friends who were like, yeah, I want to like do this and this, but then they they kind of didn't. And I was like, is that going to be like me? I don't know. Like, and so I I feel like sometimes it's one of those things where it, like, obviously everyone is different. Like, but like, I felt like for me, I needed to leave Alice Springs at some point. And then if I wanted to come back, I would have to come back after going away for a bit because I, yeah, I think you, you don't want to die wondering, do you? Like you do want to go out and feed. Yeah, because it's interesting since I feel like when I met, when I met like people in Melbourne, like for example, like first year of uni, all these people had like big dreams and they thought it was actually possible. And I was like, I'm keeping like my <laughs> aspirations low. And I felt like that was the mindset I had because I grew up in Alton Springs. Like I was like, I'm keeping it low. Like if I get a job as a journalist anywhere, like that'd be amazing. Yeah. And then yeah. they'll like, I want to be like a foreign correspondent. I want to be like chief political. I want to like be an oh anchor. My God, right? Like these, um, I, I remember meeting those kids and being like, how do you know how to dream so big? Like, yeah. And I was like, that's like, whoa, that's amb- ambitious. And I was like, I never thought of that. You know, I used to, I used to think when I was a kid and cause I like, I'm probably more romantically inclined to country life even today um then you know a lot of people are some people leave and never want to return ever whereas you know I'm like now I'm thinking about going fuck maybe I'm ready to go back for not forever but for a year or two just to chill out for a bit and maybe do some writing but I remember when I was a teenager and I saw people who were in their mid-30s and late 30s of course I thought they were old at the time and I was an idiot um I saw them leave and then come back in their late thirties, and I used to think of them as failures. <laughs> like genuinely, I was just like, yeah. "Well, clearly they didn't make it." And I was like, in Tasmania, I don't know if you watched um, Rosehaven, that uh, ABC comedy with Luke and um, Celia Picola, but the Tasmanians have this saying, and this is true in real life. Like, if someone moves from Tasmania to Melbourne, for example, and then they come back, um, people in Tasmania are just like, "Oh, you couldn't hack it on the mainland." Um, and that's the mentality. Oh, you couldn't hack it. You couldn't yeah. hack the city life. And so you've you failed and you you turned home, you turned around home. Um, look, I think that's basically all we have time for tonight. Yusuf, do you have any particularly profound closing thoughts that you'd like to add? <laughs> <laughs> you on the spot, you know? Yeah, look, I I think that you should definitely just check out the book and actually know what I'm talking about and <laughs> just talking about a bit more and just to get a bit more context because I think I, I've I'm still um reading it but there's so there's really good writing in there and I'm like damn I don't know how you pick mine Rick because it's, it's <laughs> astonishing writing I like I, I'm, I'm picking for everything it's like picking for a fruit salad like I want I want <laughs> short I want long I want a bit crisp of writing for, yeah want I want some stuff. poetics um so yeah, it's just like, you know, it's a yeah, little buffet, little buffet. And it really is like, honestly, it's such a beautiful collection of writing. Um, so thank you everyone for coming along and, and hearing us out tonight. Um, Growing Up in Country Australia um, is published by Blacking um, Black Books and is available to borrow right now from Geelong Regional Libraries. And you can also purchase a copy of the book um, in your local bookstores. Um, we will get some links um, posted in the chat um, and also send them out to you on uh newsletter i'm sure i'm sure that can be arranged um thank you everyone i really appreciate it and that's been a thrill um thanks for coming along and we'll see you all soon hopefully <laughs>